in the third. His first collegiate points of his career. Finds the back door and a pin block from Bumena. Weston, another three. Nylon! Now always right in the corner for three. Swish! Court right now with offensive possession for Rhode Island. Finds a wide open Jaden House in the corner for three. Why not? Book it! Jaden House continuing the offense for Rhode Island despite the Fordham run. What a great open three. That's exactly what the crowd wants. That's exactly what the Rhode Island team wants. Now only a one-point deficit. 58-57, Fordham now with the ball. Rose guarded by Courtright. Middle side take high. And the foul, no basket. Courtright picks up another foul. That's his fourth personal. 3.26 on the game clock. Again, Fordham up by one. But a crucial foul from Courtright. You need him in these last three and a half minutes. Absolutely. These guards have been terrific on offense and defense. You take one of them out. That's a that's a hard that's a hard thing to deal with. So Connor anticipating how things have been going. This one's gonna come down to the wire. If Rhode Island can hang on. Again, Fordham's been in the driver's seat these last few minutes, but Jaden House's last three in the corner, stopping the run. Rose hits the first free throw. Again, 21 points for him, a season high. Fordham up by two. The Rhodey Ruckus student section riled up for the second free throw, but that one drops. 60-57. The visiting Rams lead. Courtright walking the ball up the floor. The high arcing pass to Estevez. Back to Courtright. Wide open Fumina, another slam! Jeremy Fumina raising the roof. Time out, Archie Miller. Ray sequence, slow the, down, slow, slow the ball down, find an open man. That's what you're gonna get, Fumina, excellent dunk. We'll break down that last play, we'll take it with you, a quick break here on WRIU. You're listening on 90.3 FM. Fordham, up by three. Time out, Fordham the other end. Rose left alone, guarded by House. Just passing the three minute mark on the game clock. Gray comes back in, the teardrop over Fuchs falls. Again, we saw Elijah Gray in foul trouble. He has four, but he subs back in. A quick bucket out of the timeout. 62-59, Fordham leads. Courtright, left side guarded by Rose. Signaling Fumina, here's the screen. He won't use it, but the switch leaves Fumina wide open. 10 second shot clock for Rhode Island. Fumina looking to make something happen. Guarded by Rivera, dumps it to House. House drives right side, take the spin. Here's the fader. That one falls. Jaden House, again, we saw how he was quiet in that first half in foul trouble. Nine of his points collectively tonight. Seven of them coming in this second half. 62-61, 20-30 on the game clock. Another free throw line jumper from Charlton, no good. Fuchs comes away with the rebound. Both sides from the field, three of their last three. Now just passing the two minute mark in this second half. Courtright and Rose at center court. Here's a screen from Fuchs. Courtright, right side take, trying to find Fuchs on the slip, but that one stripped away from Rose. No contact. A wide open Charlton, the two on one off the glass. And connects for Antrell Charlton. Weston a little bit late to the party defensively. Tough, tough scenario. House is trying to avoid the foul. Weston couldn't get it down. Good finish. Rhode Island has time to regroup. Fordham now with a three-point lead. 120 on the game clock. Fuchs left alone, guarded by Rivera. Trying to find Weston back door. No good. Fumina will be left alone. Top of the key. Three. That one falls. Jeremy Fumina. The three to the crowd. Knotted up at 64. Now. Here's 12 Sports. Entering the night, Red Sox fans out there still hanging on to some hope. Maybe, just maybe, the walk-off last night coupled with the season debut of Trevor Story could be a spark for the club, especially during a soft part of the schedule. Second game of four against the Royals. KC, the early 1-0 lead in the fourth. Cutter Crawford grooves a 90-mile-an-hour fastball right up the middle, and Drew Waters doesn't miss an inch. KC up 3-0 early. Next inning, Adam Duvall hit a solo shot to start a rally for the Sox. Then later in the inning, Connor Wong singles a homer 
for Alex Verdugo. That was the closest the Sox would get. Unfortunately, the bullpen allowed six runs in the final five innings. Royals mashed 15 hits and beat the Sox 9-3. Another 7-10 first pitch tomorrow night. South side of Chicago Yankees, Isaiah Kiner Falefa rips a two RBI double in the fourth to get the scoring started for the Yankees. They bounce back in the win column with the 7-1 final. Today could have very well been the Patriots' final team training camp practice of the summer, considering the joint practices the next two weeks with the Packers and Titans. But for now, all eyes are on the Texans. Bill Belichick telling reporters today that the lesser experienced players will get most of the game reps on Thursday. Team related news, they are reuniting with the player who helped them win two Super Bowl titles. Defensive end Trey Flowers is back. He was drafted in 2015 and spent four seasons here before a big payday with the Lions and one injury riddled season in Miami last year. The 29 year old adds a veteran presence to the pass rushing unit and even though he will begin on the physically unable to perform list, his teammates know the impact that he can make. He a dog. <laughs> Trey's a great guy, man. You know how Trey is. I mean, if you, anybody who reported on Trey the last since 2016 till when he left, he's been very productive, a great leader. So good to have him back in the locker room. Taught me a lot. So um, always good to see Trey. He's a, he's a great player. I mean, obviously he was great here. He's had a great career. Um, so it's fun to see him. Thursday's game with the Texans and all three preseason games this month can be seen live on our air, the CW Providence. In hockey, Jeremy Swayman spoke to the media for the first time since signing his arbitration deal. The goalie is content entering his third year in the NHL, especially with the team he's on and city he plays for. But the sticky process he had to endure is something he says he never wants to experience again. You know, there's no ill will on, on the process because I understand that uh, I'm not the first player to go through it. I'm not the last, but I definitely don't wish it upon any of my friends or teammates uh, moving forward, and I don't want to do it ever again as well. So uh, I'm grateful I went through it. I'm glad we got it done. I'm a Boston Bruin at the end of the day. And Smithfield Little League now just two wins away from Williamsport. They can take a huge step forward tomorrow night in the Metro Region semifinals. They will face New Jersey on ESPN2 at 7 p.m. The winner clinches a spot in the championship game on Friday night against New York. And that's a check on your sports tonight. I'm Camille Simone. And as we said, Fordham capitalizing on the errors from Rhode Island and finding the gaps on their defense to capitalize on offense. But we've seen both power from each side. So let's see what team can run away with it and see if Fordham can close. Talabong sets it over now. Disu to Lipsky. Right side, Arzaga hits it up high. Ball stays in play. Disu, hard attack. Lipsky pops that one high. Talabong keeping it in play. And that point awarded to Rody. Just bounced around and then landed out of bounds. So Rhode Island will get the point after the timeout. And deficit's now just four. Maddie Disu set to serve for Rhode Island. Lipsky, here's the set. Hard power from Jenkins. Jenkins got all of that one and take the point right back for Foreman taking a look just the elevation no yeah. the wind up from Jenkins. We saw her sub in early in the third. And she's been a key adjustment ever since for Fordham's offense. Now they lead 21 to 6, uh, 21 to 16 in this fourth. As Moody sends it over. Hard block from Blayhot. So Rhode Island. Continuing to attempt to chip away. But as I mentioned, not too much time to do it here in the fourth set. Time slowly winding down for Rhode Island, as you said, Zach. Fordham just four points away from closing, but Rhode Island creeping up the door. That'll definitely not help. Blayhot doesn't even graze the rim, or graze the, the net, excuse me. You know, basketball's in a few weeks, you're getting <laughs> there, getting excited few weeks the home opener for both teams. My mind's been set in a basketball mode, Zach, but still got some volleyball left to call. 
as both team seasons are coming to an end shortly. But right now, Fordham, again, three points away from closing it out. Hard hit from Brown. Disu keeps it in play. Here's Owens. Two more away from closing. Fordham, one of their largest leads of the night now on Rhode Island. So the six-point lead I mentioned, Ron had stuck around, and now Fordham has found momentum and just trying to push the Rams down and out, but not yet after the error. Too much power on the serve. Few more subs for Rhode Island. Butler will come back in, as well as Bowman. No new subs for Fordham as Butler sends it over. Moody, here's the set from Woodrow. Now the hard hit from Brown. Power, a great dig to keep it in play. And Bowman unable to get that one over as Fordham just one away from taking the win over Rhode Island. And we mentioned earlier in the broadcast back at Rose Hill Gym in New York on Fordham's home, home grounds. They took the sweep back on October 4th. Rhode Island came away with a win in one set here today. Let's see if they can keep it. But that'll do it here at Keeney Gym. Audrey Brown with the block on the right side will conclude it for both sides. So the battle in the Rams goes in favor of Fordham. And we are back, guys. Welcome back to another episode of Cam's Corner, Season 3, Episode 23, Episode 91 overall, still on that road to 100. But today joining me, a Syracuse alum, 2019 Jim Nance Award winner, awarded to the best collegiate sports broadcaster in the nation, and currently the play-by-play -play voice for the Celtics on the road, filling in for the legendary Mike Gorman once this season concludes uh, after Mike's retirement, Drew Carter. Drew, what an honor it is. To have you on Cam's Corner, I appreciate you uh, hopping on during your busy schedule. How you been? What's up, Cam? 100%, man. Thanks for having me. Um, although, I mean, you're friends with Joe Mazzula, so it's not an honor <laughs> to talk to me. Like, you got you got friends in high places, man. You don't need to be saying that to me. But uh, it's great to be here, despite the, the Jalen Brunson jersey behind you. I love Jalen Brunson, but I can't co-sign a Knicks jersey. Yeah, that's, that's the way I mix emotions. You talk about Joe, I mean... It, it, it was tough when I obviously when he got the news and he was the head coach of the Celtics, I'm like, that's amazing news. But it's like now I'm drawn because I'm like a diehard Knicks fan. Me and my dad are like diehard yeah. Knicks fans. And it's like you got to root for the Celtics. You got to root for Joe and, you know, the hometown kid from Johnson from where I'm from. So um, that was actually the first question I wanted to ask you, you know, thinking about questions to conduct this interview. It's like, you know, what do you ask somebody like Drew Carr, who's done everything, who's had at such a young age? You know what I mean? So it's very inspiring for me to look at um, looking back at all your recent work. But. Um, I told you about Dan Missoula, his dad, uh, before we hopped on the pod, um, how much of an influential part in my life he played um, and how much Joe resembles him. So I wanted to ask you firsthand when you first got on the job, uh, you know, we'll, we'll backtrack and, and talk about your entire journey, but your first initial thoughts of Joe. Well, the first time I met Joe was, first of all, thanks for saying the, the kind words. That's not really nice of you. I appreciate it. Uh, but the first time I met him was before a preseason game. I think it was our opener. Uh, you also mentioned, too, that one of your first jobs was with um, CBS 42 in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, Post-grad, I, I want to know, too, like, that transition. Like, you you obviously had play-by-play -play in the back of your head, but yeah. you're taking these anchoring jobs, these reporting jobs. How do you transition from – jobs like that like what is that application process like and, and and stuff like that what goes into all of that yeah it's a great question cam because i i agonized over that decision whether to take that job so when i was when i graduated i was like i'm just going to take the summer i'm going to go home to minnesota i'm going to hang with my family i'm going to hang with our corgi and not worry about the job hunt until the fall which i don't know how smart that was because i i do want to do play-by-play -play. it's always been the thing i wanted to do out of school and the timing of that is kind of tough because minor league baseball t tends to start in April and, and I graduated in May. So the timing wasn't great. Throughout all that adversity too. Like, I mean, you're in this spot for a reason that you're in right now with the Celtics. And um, again, we talked about like those games that, that didn't go your way or, or weren't, you know, traditional to the way that you're used to broadcasting, but it led you to this point with the Celtics, all that stuff and all that yeah. um, adversity throughout your journey is run me through that process of, of getting that gig with the Celtics. You know what I mean? Like that, 
that build up to that anticipation, everything that went into that day and that whatever, how long process it was. It's crazy, Cam. It's like, I might have said this on Forsberg's pod, but it's like I would compare that process to like a three hour movie where nothing really happens in the first two hours and 45 minutes. And then the last 15 are just crazy. To all the SCAA judges, employers, and of course, John Chalesnik, I just want to say thank you very much for looking over my Jim Nance Award application and just wanted to end off this video showcasing uh, the documentary I was able to premiere, produce, and edit last April titled Coach, the Legacy of Daniel E. Missoula Jr. Dan was the father of Boston Celtics head coach Joe Missoula and just such an influential icon in the town of Johnston and in youth sports here in Rhode Island and, again, a huge part of my life and the main reason why I got into sports broadcasting just due to all the hard work and the lessons he was able to teach me and all my teammates uh, premiered in front of about 400 people in the Dan Missoula Rec Center that he built from the ground up. Uh, I believe 5,000 views now on YouTube. So, again, just a, a very touching piece to my heart. I just wanted to attach the trailer, um, again, going into all the work that I've been able to do over the course of my four years in college. So, again, thank you very much for looking at the application, and I hope you enjoy the trailer. The town of Johnston is now home to a new multi-million dollar recreation center. Look at them clapping. The grand opening today drew a huge crowd. And thankfully for those in attendance, it's an indoor facility. I can tell my athletes there's no crying. But this is truly a great day in Johnston. This whole thing about uh, coaching, it wasn't just coaching to win games coaching to win in life. That coaching aspect, there was something that growing up that was our lives. That was him as a dad and I don't think I'd change it. I loved it. He was real. He was an assertive person who when he walked into a gym his presence was shown. And that's the realness. I never got a good job because my dad saw it as you should be playing like that because that's how good you are. That's one of the biggest things that I took from him is if you're going to do something you've got to you gotta go all out and you have to do it. Whenever you needed something, he was always there. That was Danny. A rainy day, we gotta get a game in. Dan Mazzulla as the recreation director would be on the field with the rubber boots on, pumping the field out. There's no other recreation director in the state that would be doing that. I've never seen anybody get here at, you know, 7.15, 7.30 in the morning and go home at 9, 10 o'clock at night because teams didn't have a coach or they needed a referee. He employed kids to make sure they had jobs, had money in their pockets. He wanted to teach people what it meant to work hard. That's his whole goal. Help young people be better people. If you wanted to play something you were going to play, he would find a way and make it happen. He was all about community. He was like a superman. It was more than basketball to him. 